In the 1950s, the breakthrough in, in virology was the demonstration that the nucleic acid of the virus is the genetic code. And even though this sounds obvious today, it wasn't back then. People thought that the proteins, in fact, uh, might be the important parts because they were so much more complicated. Nucleic acids were simple. They only had four different chemicals in them. And this <coughs> conclusion came from initially uh, two kinds of studies. First, uh, the Hershey Chase experiment, a very famous experiment, which I'm sure you were taught uh, in biology with bacteriophage T4, shown here in, in an electron micrograph. Uh, and then the work of Frankel Conrad uh, with tobacco mosaic virus. And I'm not sure we're going to talk about this today, but what they did here was simply to take the virus and break it into RNA and protein components and showed that the RNA had the infectivity of the virus. Hershey Chase will talk about right here. So here is uh, Al Hershey and Martha Chase. Uh, they worked at Cold Spring Harbor for many years out on Long Island. And they did this very famous experiment using a food blender, a common kitchen blender. And what they did, they wanted to know if you take a bacteriophage, wh which is the genetic information, which specifies the production of more viruses? Is it the protein shell or is it the nucleic acid? So they would grow phages with radioactive precursors to protein or radioactive precursors to the DNA. And when they labeled the DNA, and then they, they would infect E. coli very briefly and then use the, a blender to shear off the infecting phage. That was what the blender was for. So they only let the phage attach very briefly enough to put the, the genetic information in the cell. And when they did this, uh, the radioactivity was predominantly found in the cell after a brief infection when you labeled the DNA. Uh, and then the DNA was detected in the next generation of phage. And it, when you labeled the protein, the, the coat of the virus, uh, that did not remain cell associated and it was never passed on to the next generation. So this is called the Hershey Chase experiment. If you ever go out to Cold Spring Harbor for a meeting, there's a library out there. I think it's called the Carnegie Library. And they have one of uh, Hershey's blenders in a, in a glass case there uh, for you to look at. It's pretty neat. It was out there this summer. So this was very important because it showed that the nucleic acid was the genetic information of the virus. Now, even the bigger surprise, perhaps above that the nucleic acid is, is the genetic information, because in fact for cells we already knew that. We knew that the DNA of cells was the genetic information. So this was a good move forward, but not a big surprise. But what really uh, is surprising, you know, I've told you a lot about all the viruses that are out there, billions and billions, and um, all different kinds, shapes, forms, yet in the end you can make them all fall into very nice categories because they only have a finite number of nucleic acid genomes and that is number seven and that's a number you should remember because it's easy right it's a subway number but uh, it's going to help you remember all the different viral genomes because when you count up to seven uh, you'll be done all right seven different kinds of genome and that will really help us organize all these viruses in terms of how they work it will really help you so <clears throat> The key fact that will really, in addition to the number seven, to help organize all of this is that every viral genome has to make mRNA that the host can translate. Because remember, no uh, virus encodes a complete translation apparatus. Viruses are parasites of the host translation system. So every virus follows this rule. And I would guess that if we ever found a virus that didn't, it probably wouldn't be a virus. It would be a cell of some kind, a very small cell. So all viruses have to make mRNA that can be read. So if you think of that, then every virus replication cycle is simple in the sense that it all has to lead to mRNA that can be pr translated by the host cell. And that's a ribosome. It's not a turkey. This is, <laughs> this is a ribosome. <clears throat> all right. Now, David Baltimore, who uh, was a Nobel laureate for discovering an enzyme that we'll talk about later on, another lecture, he used this insight, the idea that every virus has to make mRNA to organize all the known viral genomes into this scheme, which is uh, nicely called the Baltimore scheme. Um, and he put mRNA in the middle. He said every genome has to lead to this. And then he arrayed around it all the known genomes. This was in the 70s that he did that. He put single-stranded DNA plus 
sense RNA that goes through a DNA intermediate, other plus stranded RNA viruses, uh, negative stranded RNA viruses, double stranded RNA viruses. We're, we're going to talk about each of these in detail. He missed one. I, I didn't tell you double stranded DNA, of course. He got that as well. All the ones that are numbered, he got. But at the time when he made this scheme, the hepatitis B virus had not yet uh, been discovered. Its genome wasn't known. And so that was added later, this funny double stranded DNA with gaps. So he said all of these have to go to mRNA. So we arrange them in this very nice rubric, which if you learn, it will help you enormously because given a viral genome, you'll be able to figure out how it's expressed. And we'll go through that today. David Baltimore, of, uh, of course, likes to fish. That's him up there. Uh, so before we go on with the Baltimore scheme, let's do some definitions. So we are all talking the same language, and these have to do with polarity. As you know, probably mRNA is, by convention, the plus strand. Someone asked me last year, does it have to do with charge or something, electricity? No, it has nothing to do with any of that. It's just convention that what is translated mRNA is called the plus strand. So a DNA strand that is the equivalent polarity as mRNA is the plus strand. And of course, the complements of plus strands are negative strands or minus strands. So we, we use the word interchangeably, plus positive, minus negative. And it's just a way to identify what strand we're talking about. And of course, mRNA, the plus strand is ribosome ready. It can be translated into protein. That's the definition of mRNA. But one thing I want to tell you is that not all plus RNA, especially in the virus world, is mRNA. There are some viruses that have plus stranded RNA genomes. But it's not mRNA. It's not translated. So just being plus stranded is not enough to get you translated. There are other requirements as well. All right, so then when we look at the Baltimore scheme, these pluses and minus, that's what they refer to, the polarity of the nucleic acid uh, with respect to mRNA. So for example, the single-stranded plus strand DNA viruses. They have a single strand of DNA. It's plus polarity. That is the same polarity as mRNA. But of course, DNA cannot be translated. And that's one of the things you, you realize already by looking at the kind of nucleic acids that's present. You can already deduce uh, what viruses have to do to get to mRNA. <clears throat> so this is really an elegant system. All you have to know is what kind of genome is in the virus. And then you can tell me all of the steps that have to be taken to get mRNA. Okay. Because, in fact, when a virus brings a genome into the cell, that's, that's what it has to do. It has to make mRNA to initiate the infectious cycle. So if you can remember this scheme, you'll be able to trace it. And that's really uh, a lot of what we want you to know in this course. So you don't have to memorize that there are billions and billions of viruses, but just that there are seven different genome types in the way that they get to uh, mRNA. So here are the seven classes of genome. We have double-stranded DNA, so there's a bunch of viruses with DNA genomes. They can be double-stranded or single-stranded, and they can be gapped. So that really covers everything. I, I can't think of anything else, single, double-stranded, and a gap. A gap was thrown in later, but makes sense. And then we have RNA, viruses with RNA genomes. And this is, of course, what is in the particle itself, the, the virus particle. It, that's what I mean by the genome. Uh, shown up here on this slide. So we have double-stranded RNA genomes, and then we have single-stranded RNA genomes. But we have uh, single-stranded RNA genomes of three types. We have plus-stranded, uh, we have minus-stranded, and then we have a plus-stranded genome which goes through a DNA intermediate. These are very special viruses that we'll deal with separately. All right, so those are the seven classes. Now you may ask why aren't there plus single-stranded DNA viruses and minus single-strand DNA viruses. I don't know. I don't know why there aren't any plus and minus DNA. There are some uh, of these single-stranded DNA viruses that package either a plus or a minus strand, but we don't know any that is exclusively either plus or minus like these RNA viruses. All right? You just have to accept that they exist and we don't know why. Now, in addition to these seven genome types. That's really the main thing you need to know. But I, I just want to show you the different kinds of structures that these seven types occur in. So they can be linear. They can be circular. They can occur in segments. So some viral genomes are in one molecule. 
unimolecular, if you will, and some are segmented. They come in pieces. All right? You could say that our genome is segmented, right? It's in chromosomes. It's in pieces. And some viruses are, are segmented. They're not really chromosomes because they don't have the same structure, but they're sub segmented. Gapped, as we said already, with the hepatitis B. Uh, single strands of plus and minus po polarity. There's also a single-stranded genome that's ambisense. It's got components of both plus and minus strands in it. Pretty unusual. We have double-stranded, of course. And then some genomes have proteins covalently attached to them. Some have the ends cross-linked. So you have a double-stranded DNA, and where you would normally have five and three prime ends, they're just cross-linked, so you have a little circle at the end. So if you denature it, it would become a single-stranded circle. And some have DNA with covalently attached RNA. So all kinds of things happen. Now, this is less important. These are the details, which we'll explain to you. But the seven is really the important part, the seven uh, different genome types. Now, you may be wondering, what is the purpose of all of this? Does having seven different genome types and all these weird configurations make a difference? Does it? have to do with the biology of the virus? Does it have to do with evolution? Um, is it advantageous? And maybe most of all, you want to know if you have to memorize it. So let me try and answer. There's a lot of ignorance here, unfortunately. I can't answer most of these questions. But I, I, I sense that people think of this right away. Humans have DNA genomes. All humans. All mammals do. So why do viruses have to have all these configurations? Well, we don't know the answer. All we can do is guess, and we get better at guessing, but in the end, it's still a guess. So for example, um, the structure and composition of the genome, whether it's DNA, RNA, single or double-stranded, is a reflection of how it replicates. But that's really because the replication has to accommodate the, the strandedness and the polarity and the composition of the genome. So it doesn't really tell us anything. There are viruses with all of these seven types of genomes out there, and I don't know if any one has a selective advantage over another. For example, I would say, so if I'm looking at viruses from a human point of view, which is wrong, right, so you shouldn't do this, as I told you before, I would say the plus-stranded, single-stranded RNA viruses would be the most advantageous because it's a plus strand, it's an mRNA. As soon as it gets in the cell, boom, it can be translated. I would say that this would be the fastest and the most advantageous. Now, there are a lot of plus strand viruses on the globe, but they're not the only ones. <clears throat> there are lots of other. There are negative strand viruses. Why would you do that? As you'll see, with a negative strand, you have to carry an enzyme in the particle in order to, to initiate infection. So, you see, none of this makes sense when you look at it from our point of view. But from an evolutionary point of view, at some time, a plus strand, a minus strand, a gapped genome, it worked it survives. And that's all we can say at this point. Not a great answer, but that's what we're stuck with. Now, another interesting question is, why do we have both DNA and RNA genomes in viruses? And that, I think, we can address a little better, although it's still speculative. I think you know that many people believe that the first world of life was an RNA world, where all the organisms had RNA genomes. There's some evidence some pretty good evidence for this from a variety of areas. So we think that these RNA viruses evolved during the RNA world. So there are RNA cells first, and then RNA viruses evolved probably from those cells, but we don't know, to infect them. Uh, and uh, those RNA viruses that existed then are probably the ancestors of all the RNA viruses that we have today. So maybe our RNA viruses are relics from that RNA world. Now at some point, the idea goes that there's a switch from RNA to DNA-based organisms. Or maybe not a switch, but DNA-based organisms evolved. And the whole idea behind this is very interesting. Um, but there was a, a, another kind of organism that had DNA. And these RNA-based organisms slowly were competed out. But the RNA viruses lived. Why, why would there be a switch? We have no idea. We don't know what the selection would be for that. It could be that a DNA-based organism arose. So enzymes arose that could change RNA chemically into DNA, and they survived, and they had some kind of advantage. That's really all we can say. So the way I look at it is RNA viruses are pretty old. They've been very successful, and the DNA, <laughs> the DNA viruses are the uh, newcomers on the block. Now, in terms of memorization, this is the one thing I think you should memorize. The number seven, which is easy. You know, you have lots of number seven references here in New York City. <clears throat> 
um, and this scheme, which is very easy to do, you put mRNA in the middle and then draw the seven different kinds of viral genome around it. I don't care if you know the numbers here, that doesn't mean anything. All you need to do is draw all these viral genome types and then be able to draw the pathway to mRNA. Because just knowing that, you're going you're gonna to conquer the first half of this course, because you're going to understand what we're talking about when we talk about RNA and DNA synthesis and so forth, okay? Now, as we illustrate these processes, we'll use specific viruses as examples. And you see I've put a few of them here, so you know what virus has a single-stranded negative-strand genome. Otherwise, it would be really not interesting to you at all. So negative-strand RNA viruses include influenza and Ebola. Uh, polio, the plus strand. Retroviruses are the ones that go from a plus strand to a DNA intermediate. Parvoviruses, <coughs> hepatitis B, adenovirus, herpes, rio, and rotavirus. So these are just a, a few of all the viruses that exist, but we're going to come back to these over and over and use them as examples. So you should know that rheovirus has a double-stranded RNA genome, because if we say on a test, uh, rheoviruses do what when the genome enters the cell? You're going to have to know that it's double-stranded RNA. So this, this one slide is very important, but this is very easy to do. Okay, so memorize these seven genome types. You should start doing it. Maybe you could wait until the first exam if you're good at that sort of thing. And, I, and this is what I want you to know. If you know the genome structure, how mRNA is made and how the genome is copied. All right. Eventually, we're going to learn about how the genomes are copied in a, in a more detailed way than today. But from today's perspective, given any virus genome class, a single-stranded plus sense, for example, you're going to tell me how mRNA is made and how the genome is copied. <laughs>